1 Kings, it's a real familiar passage. Uh, this is in the Message Bible translation. Then Elijah was told, go stand on the mountain at attention before God. God will pass by. A hurricane wind ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks before God. But God wasn't to be found in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle and quiet whisper. When Elijah heard the quiet voice, he muffled his face with his great cloak, that's his outer cloak, and went to the mouth of the cave and stood there. A quiet voice asked, So Elijah, now tell me, what are you doing here? Elijah said it again, I've been working my heart out for God the God of the angel armies, because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed your places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me. Have you ever felt like Elijah? I'm the only one left. And now everybody else is trying to harm me. Well, remember God's words to Elijah right after Elijah said this. He said, listen, Elijah, there are yet 7,000 people in Israel who have not bail, bowed down to this false god Baal. You're not alone. And then immediately after this passage, when Elijah returned, to Israel, God uh, gave him a helper, Elisha. And he really needed a helper because he was feeling pretty down, pretty down and out. And, and God gave him a helper. One of the wonderful things about the power of silence is when you make yourself as silent as you can, you try to let all these racing thoughts go by and you just sit silently in the presence of God. God will introduce himself to you. Gently, quietly, calmly. God will introduce himself to you at your deepest area of need. Part of what Elijah was doing in this passage is he was uh, playing the victim role. And we all do that. Uh, my dad used to have a saying, nobody loves me, nobody loves me, I think I'll go out and eat worms. And then he'd, he'd always tell the story. When he was in college, he was there on the GI Bill after World War II and the college would give him jobs, you know, raking leaves, and it was a big campus. And when they were raking leaves, one guy found a worm and he held it up. This is to keep you awake during the worship message. And he said, I'll give a dollar to anyone who will eat this worm. There were two or three other guys raking leaves. They were making a dollar an hour, so that was a lot of money. And the, the guy next to my dad said, yeah, I'll take it. And he chewed it up and ate the worm. And, and then he held out his hand. He said, you had no idea how much I needed that dollar. <laughs> that, that beautiful campus was originally a rich person's home in the, in the Riviera of Santa Barbara. And it was built by Mexican laborers working for a dollar a day and all the wine they could drink. <laughs> So there's another dollar story involved in that. But many times we do, we play this, uh, the victim role. Oh, God, everybody's against me. Nothing's going right at work. My neighbors are all bad. My kids are not doing things right. 
thick old gooey worms. <laughs> of course, all that does, when we play the victim, all that does is harm us. Uh, and it, it stops the flow of the Holy Spirit. And so God was trying to help Elijah get in the flow of the Holy Spirit again. He said, now listen, there's 7,000 people that haven't turned their back on me. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you a helper, Elisha. And so uh, the, the wonderful story of how God took care of Elijah. Other than Moses, to me, Elijah is the greatest Hebrew prophet. I love studying his life. Many of his miracles were mirrored later on by Jesus of Nazareth. And he was just a tremendous man of God. But you know, no matter how close you are to God, you're going to have weak times in your life. And it's really important during these weak times to sit in silence with God's presence surrounding you. And imagine, imagine God's presence all around you when you sit in silence. Jesus understood silence pretty well. Uh, he would go out and pray all night. He would leave his disciples and go out and pray all night to God. And a lot of Jesus' prayers, I'm sure, were just sitting silently, getting his soul recharged. Uh, a friend of mine knew I went down to my ranch on a regular basis just to be alone. And uh, gave me a wonderful mural, a poster. It said, it showed great, beautiful forests. And it said, in silence, we are least alone. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn, one of my great spiritual healer, um, heroes, he became a believer. He was a major in the Russian field artillery. He sent a letter back to a friend of his in Moscow making a joke about Stalin. The KGB, the secret police of Russia, read that letter, pulled him off the battle zone fighting the Germans. This is a major commanding field artillery units. Pulled him out of his uniform and threw him in the Gulag Archipelago. They didn't even give him a chance to change his uniform. He was thrown in prison as a major in the Russian field artillery army. He was there for a dozen years. He was an atheist, like all good communists, when he went into prison. But there was so much silence in prison that he began to watch the Russian Orthodox Christians who'd memorized scriptures, who'd memorized the liturgy, who were singing Christian hymns that they'd memorized in prison. And he watched their lives. The silence of that prison system in the presence of God and that silence in the presence of other Christians, he became a believer. He said an interesting thing about silence, too, in one of his books. He said, you know, if you're in silence long enough, you become like a monk or a nun. And you begin to have spiritual things happen to you. We would know when other prisoners were going to leave long before they left we would knew, know when new prisoners were going to come before they ever came. We develop spiritual abilities. If you really, and I've always wanted to develop spiritual abilities and be more like Jesus and the 12 apostles, the power of silence will do that to you. And I love to sit alone in the forest if you sit still and you get in the forest before the, the sun comes up, birds will land on your shoulder. I've had deer and coyotes walk right up to me, sniff me and wonder who I was. I've had spiritual beings come to me. 
that were verified later by people who knew those parts of the forest. The power of silence is one of the secrets of Jesus' life. One of the secrets of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Christian faith, one of the secrets of every follower of God in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian scriptures. This song, uh, Calling in the Night, which we were singing together, in the silence of the night, the Spirit of God came to the little boy named Samuel in the temple, little boy named Samuel, and was speaking to him, and he thought it was Eli the priest speaking to him, but it wasn't. It was the Spirit of God, and four times he got up and said, here I am, you called me. And Eli said, I didn't call you. And finally, the fourth time it happened, well, the third time it happened, Eli said, listen, that must be God calling you. So it's not me calling you. I'm trying to get back to sleep, and you keep waking me up. <laughs> and that's my, my translation. <laughs> and he said, next time that happens, just say, speak, Lord, for your servants listening. Samuel became a tremendous prophet, and he helped Israel get its first king, King David, his first good king, King David, and just a tremendous man of God. Silence was one of the secrets to Samuel's life, his spiritual life. So God is not in hurricane winds. He's not in earthquakes. Did you experience that earthquake? Uh, it was a couple of days ago, I think, and it was just before eight, and I was talking to Kathleen, and all of a sudden, things in the bedroom started swinging. And there was a big earthquake in Kansas. Those of you listening on YouTube, by big, I mean by Kansas standards, it was 4.2 on the Richter scale. It started in Hutchison, Kansas. It was filled in Manhattan, and we could fill it in Holton which is about 30 miles south of Horton. But none of you felt that quake? Yeah, we, we were just a little bit, of course we're in a two-story house too, you know, there's a little more <laughs> axis movement in a two-story house. But um, if we hadn't been silent, we wouldn't have felt that earthquake. But God is not in hurricanes, he's not in earthquakes, he's not in the wind, he wasn't even in the fire. He was in a gentle, and quiet whisper to Elijah. Uh, one time when I was in Oklahoma working and I, I worked, one of the jobs I worked was working in a pipe factory making pipes for the oil fields. I knew God was sending me somewhere. So I went in the, in the middle of 160 acres of Oklahoma prairie. There was nobody around me. And I said, uh, God, I know you're sending me somewhere. I really want to know. I mean, and I, I, I've been praying that for some time, so I was getting real intense about this. And uh, this gentle but strong voice said to me, patience. At that time, I wasn't in the military, but it was like a four-star general speaking to the lowest private in the army, and I heard it very clearly. And I said, yes, sir, right away, sir. I, I knew God was saying, just hold on. I'm gonna guide your life. Have a little patience. And God led me to Kansas City, and then to Northeast Kansas. I've never felt more at home any place in the world, and I've been all over the world, than I do in Northeast Kansas. I won't go into that. That's a commercial message for Northeast Kansas, but God will guide you if you're quiet. After I asked God, I was silent. And the voice was so real that I turned around and looked to see if somebody was around me, and there was nobody around me for 160 acres of flat 
Oklahoma prairie. I'm not unusual. Samuel's not unusual. Elijah's not unusual. Jesus is not unusual. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the 12 apostles, are not unusual. This will happen to you. If you just take hold of this power of silence, this quiet and gentle whisper of God will whisper to you. I've shared this with you before, but I want to share it again because it's such a, a pivotal area in my recent life, you know. August of 2014, I just finished my devotions, was on my knees, and this gentle and quiet voice said, I'm going to bring a change in your life. Will you obey me? And I said, well, Lord, you know, you saved my life many times. You know I'm going to obey you. And the next week, I'm with the board at Horton First Christian. They say, would you be our permanent part-time pastor? These are not Bible fairy tales. This silence, this being open to God, these are reality. You know, if Dr. Heller had not been sitting next to her father in silence, she'd been playing video games on her cell phone or, or reading her Facebook. She, she might have missed it, but she wasn't. She was, a, this is alert, we're talking about alert silence. And her father sat up in bed and said these wonderful words that I shared with you earlier. It's true. It's really true. It's all about love. As I've been thinking about this the last few days since hearing her say that, everything that we do in church is all about love. If we're a Christian when we work, everything we do is all about love. It's helping the people we work with. It's helping our company make a living. When we're in our neighborhood, it's helping our neighbors. It's all about love. It's all about love. You know, the two greatest people in, in the Bible, and of course Jesus is the greatest, the greatest person in the Hebrew scriptures, even though I like Elijah, is Moses. I have never heard this ever mentioned in church, and I've been going to church ever since I became a Christian when I was 17. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days in silence. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days in silence. Great things happen to people that are willing to take the time every day. And I would say in moments throughout every day, just to be silent and say, okay, God, this is me. I'm going to be silent for a minute or two. Is there anything you want to say to me? And I want to ask you a question. Uh, where does the Holy Spirit end and your subconscious begin if you're a Christian? They're together, aren't they? And so this power of silence is very real. If you're visualizing the presence of God, if you're doing your best to keep these nagging thoughts, I gotta polish my shoes. <laughs> I gotta wash the dishes. I need to sweep off the sidewalk after the storm, you know? If we can keep all these, these secondary thoughts at bay and just sit. The gentle, quiet voice of God will come to you. 
and you'll know the gentle side of God, the loving side of God, the healing side of God through the power of silence like you'll never know him any other way.